Thank you, everybody, for um, coming back together. What an awesome day this has been. I know I learned a lot. Um, there's so many resources out there. But we're now at a point to hear from public comments. So, Helen, can you facilitate that? Yes, I would be pleased to. Um, we have two public commenters who are in the room today, so I'm going to invite them up to the podium um, so that we can all see and hear from them. Uh, the first is Angela Taylor. Oh, there she is. Oh, I didn't see you. Who's also an alumna of uh, an Africa Council. Good afternoon. We're good. All right. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to be here to make some public comments. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Angela Taylor. My father had dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, 20 years ago, I had not heard of LBD until we were pursuing a, a diagnosis. Um, I have since had the honor of serving on this council. I am currently the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for the Lewy Body Dementia Association. Um, but first and foremost, I will always be an LBD caregiver. Um, I'd like to express my appreciation to the council, to NIH, um, for the growing recognition of the importance of the related dementias, those dementias that are not primarily caused by Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is something that's been growing in recognition over the last 20 years, and it's really wonderful to see the, um, the recognition that really there is almost no pure cause of dementia, no single cause in most people, and that we really do have to take this personalized approach. Um, this has been something that, uh, for those of us in the LBD space, um, has kind of been the norm because LBD and Alzheimer's disease so frequently coexist, but without a biomarker to be able to detect the LBD, it wasn't something that could be addressed during life. So um, we're really excited, as you can imagine, about the, the seeding amplification assay that now detects alpha-synuclein. Um, so I just wanna share a couple of comments. Uh, you'll find after these are all posted online, what I'm gonna say today are just abbreviations of the longer comments, but I think you'll get the gist of uh, what our message is. Um, we really celebrate with the whole dementia space, the approval of the uh, monoclonal antibodies for Alzheimer's disease, disease specifically uh, amyloid, and recognize that these couldn't have been made possible without the biomarker um, progress that was made in Alzheimer's disease in the last 15 or so years. And like what we've seen happen in the Alzheimer's space, we think we're at the advent of that in the Lewy body space. We do have our first biomarker that can detect with high reliability the presence of Lewy body disease in living people, whether they're healthy or whether they are symptomatic. These, this, the biomarkers that are coming out now are going to really transform our understanding, uh, not just of Parkinson's disease, but of dementia with Lewy bodies and of Alzheimer's disease. Um, NIH has been really um, quick to maximize what, what can we learn from these in very short order by funding the, um, the use of these of this assay in longitudinal um, studies like ADNI by looking back and having previous samples in Alzheimer's disease tested for synuclein. And the, the data that's coming out of these longitudinal studies is really remarkable. Um, so we know that there's uh, a lot of opportunity um, for studies that have been ongoing and a lot of opportunity for studies that will only just now be designed because these assays are available. Now, a lot of what I was gonna say has been well said by the experts in the field. So I'm gonna skip over some of the data because certainly you don't need me to reiterate what's already been um, highly uh, more scientifically explained. Um, but the thing, my takeaway, and then what I wanna leave everybody with today is that we have to look at these synuclein um, biomarkers as not just opportunities for synucleinopathies, but opportunities for the greater dementia space and especially for Alzheimer's disease. We don't know how many people in, um, in these Alzheimer's trials 
may have had coexisting Alzheimer's or coexisting Lewy body pathology and what the implication was for safety or efficacy. And we know we have the opportunity, even if not to comprehensively understand what the ramifications are, we can use the existing biomarker to start understanding it. Let's not wait for the perfect biomarker to come along. Let's use what we have now in trials as we screen and, and um, uh, characterize the, the cohorts based on coexisting Lewy body disease in Alzheimer's disease and in vice versa. Um, we're really grateful for NIH and especially NINDS who's got an approved concept for a clinical trial of these monoclonal antibodies for amyloid in Lewy body dementias. Um, we think this is uh, a disease area that might not get studied without NIH funding because it's a much smaller patient population. And so without that federal funding, families like mine might not have the opportunity to see what benefits these uh, monoclonal antibodies may have for our loved ones. So that really summarizes what I wanted to say. Uh, I truly thank you all for the work that you're doing. It warms my heart. <laughs> and, uh, and we're really excited to see what the next episode or the next era really of dementia research will be in the coming five years. And I'm just gonna make a plug for anybody who's not heard Randy Bateman's acceptance speech at uh, CTAD his Lifetime Achievement Award, go back and find it. It was absolutely remarkable. Um, so you're here. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Maybe we'll send that out to everyone. <laughs> With Randy's consent, of course. Um, next, we have Trish D'Antonio from the Gerontological Society of America. And we're going to turn to our folks who are on the phone or who are online, excuse me, on the Zoom. And we're going to start with uh, Maureen Jaffa. So Maureen, you're on, on deck. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for your time today. Uh, our mission at the Gerontological Society of America, or GSA, is to cultivate excellence in interdisciplinary aging research to advance innovations in practice and policy. Our flagship activity addressing brain health is the GSA Care Toolkit for Primary Care Teams. The four steps, kickstart, assess, evaluate, and refer, or CARE, K-A-E-R, are intended to improve health-related outcomes and well-being for people living with dementia and their families. Today, I'm pleased to share how GSA has adapted the CARE framework to support primary care teams and others to better address brain health in adults with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities. In their 2022 report, the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices, or NTG, and the New Mind IDSC Foundation documented a multitude of challenges associated with detection of cognitive impairment in adults with pre-existing neuroatypical and neurodivergent conditions. The recommendations included enhancing education for clinicians about neuroatypical conditions and how to appropriately detect and diagnose mild cognitive impairment or dementia in this underserved population. We are pleased to share that GSA, in collaboration with the NTG, the Ohio Association of County Boards of Developmental Disabilities, and the Ohio Council for Cognitive Health, has taken important steps to address this issue. With the support from AZI, GSA developed and will soon release Addressing Brain Health in Adults with Intellectual Disabilities and Developmental Disabilities, a companion to the care toolkit for primary care providers. The publication will be freely available on GSA's website at geron.org slash brain health. The goals of this companion tool are to raise awareness of the unique needs of adults living with IDD, equip and encourage caregivers and healthcare teams to engage in appropriate brain health conversations with adults with IDD, promote brain health conversations and early detection of changes in cognitive and adaptive functions for adults with IDD, and assist with the identification of community supports and resource networks aimed at enhancing function and quality of life for adults with dementia and IDD. GSA is, collaborate, is, is advancing collaborations in Ohio to facilitate education sessions for developmental disabilities and aging services providers. We look forward to spreading this work further and supporting primary care providers to feel more confident and better prepared to address brain health with all adults, including those with IDD. 
I invite you to read our written comments, which provide uh, more detailed information about this exciting new project. And as always, thank you for your commitment and service to the council. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Maureen Jaffa. And after Maureen, we'll have John Kirby. Great. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Maureen Jaffa, and I'm an executive director in Lilly's Neuroscience Business Unit. Um, Eli Lilly and company believes that the potential for meaningful change for people living with Alzheimer's disease is upon us. However, the potential benefit of amyloid plaque targeted therapies may only be realized when patients have timely and equitable access to both diagnostics and therapeutics. The National Alzheimer's Project Act seeks to accelerate the development of treatments that would prevent, halt, or reverse the course of Alzheimer's disease. Indeed, goal one of the national plan is to, quote, prevent and effectively treat Alzheimer's disease and related dementias by 2025. Unfortunately, the CMS decision to severely restrict access to Food and Drug Administration approved amyloid targeted therapies through its April 2022 national coverage decision undermines these important goals. As this council knows, CMS made this decision at a time when there was only one FDA approved drug in the class. NAVA's own 2023 report update acknowledges that the recently approved amyloid targeting treatments, quote, are an important step toward achieving the first goal of the national plan to prevent and effectively treat AD by 2025. Next generation Alzheimer's therapies are here and more are coming. Indeed, since CMS first issued the NCD, two different therapeutic products have demonstrated in peer reviewed publications of phase three clinical trials, clinically meaningful change in cognition and function. Yet to date, CMS has not revisited their 2022 coverage decision. CMS has repeatedly and publicly stated that they would reconsider the amyloid therapeutic NCD when new evidence becomes available. Lilly will soon add to this body of evidence in a forthcoming publication of yet another peer-reviewed manuscript, which directly addresses how the Dynamab data answers each of the three CED questions posed by CMS in the NCD. All of this new evidence exceeds the high level of evidence threshold, which CMS set forth as the trigger to revisit the NCD. Time is of the essence for patients when it comes to CMS action on reconsideration. It can take upwards of nine months or more for CMS to complete the reconsideration pro process, yet each day as many as 3,000 Medicare covered individuals with Alzheimer's may progress to moderate or severe Alzheimer's disease. We believe that in light of the evidence generated since the initial NCD decision, the NAPA Advisory Council should urge CMS to remove CED restrictions where positive confirmatory data is available and to recommend that CMS immediately reconsider the applicability of CED for such products. AD patients deserve better than facing access barriers to FDA approved therapies with positive confirmatory data, especially given the fatal nature of the disease and the high unmet need in Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Um, next, we have Don Kirby, and following Don will be Sue Passion. Don? Yes. Can you all hear me? We can. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. My name's Don Kirby, and I'm a new ambassador with the Association of Frontal um, Temporal Dementia or Degeneration. And I thank you for allowing me to share my story because my story will tell of my passion and my reason that I am fueled to um, help in bringing around more research and also um, education on FTD. You see, our daughter, Kara, was once a nurse, a wife, and a mother of a baby boy until progressive changes in her personality and behaviors changed and found us at Mayo Clinic where she was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia at the age of 29. And at that time, it was an, un, an incurable disease that we had never ever heard of. And due to no treatments, we um, enrolled care in the research center there at Mayo Clinic, not only to have support for um, our journey, but also hopefully to find purpose for our pain. Kara progressively and rapidly went to complete dependency requiring 24 seven care, had the inability to communicate at all, unable to show any emotion, even the ability, inability to show pain. And Kara um, sadly passed away last year at the age of 33. 
I once heard that FTD was a cancer of the soul. You become a shell of yourself. And this is so true of our daughter, Kara. It's robbed her of who she was and who she was meant to be. And most importantly, a mama who she'd always dreamt to be. I really appreciate everyone's work and consideration and especially to Alzheimer's as my mother-in-law is suffering from that. But my loss of my daughter at 33, seeing her life actually disappear before it actually started has fueled my desire to work with the AFTD to help other families and by providing support. Um, my daughter's brain was donated uh, for research and I'm really hoping and praying that at least one family has helped um, by her donation. This is a way of honoring our daughter. She as was in the uh, medical field as a nurse and I know she's shining down on all of us. And I truly appreciate you allowing me to speak today. First time I've done something like this, but I'm just so thankful that I've met, uh, come to know the people at AFTD and now also uh, your council and um, love to see the progress being made. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. Um, Sue, you are up next. And after Sue, we have Dana Fulo. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, Helen. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Sue Peshin, President and CEO of the Alliance for Aging Research. Today's meeting notice states that the Advisory Council would hear, quote, updates from the field on implementation of disease-modifying therapies for Alzheimer's. Given the subject, it seems reasonable for this Advisory Council and the public to expect to hear a six-month update from CMS on Medicare access to Lakembi, including answers to such questions as how many Medicare and MA claims have been paid so far, how many beneficiaries are enrolled in the three CMS-approved research studies, how many private insurance claims have been paid for Lakembi, and how many patients have had to access treatment through private pay, but we heard no report today. Instead, we heard ongoing Lakembi research questions and other questions in the field. And while there's still a good amount we don't know, this isn't unique to ADRD treatments. In fact, it's common not to know how a new cancer therapy impacts every potential patient. We allow patients and families to speak with their clinicians and decide what's best for them. This is done without erecting complicated coverage barriers because we get that cancer robs people of time and time is of the essence. Why do we have a different standard for Alzheimer's? We're also concerned that CMS may tie the NIA's $300 million real-world data platform to Medicare coverage as its designated registry. This would set a disturbing precedent for CMS putting the NIA and the NIH broadly in the business of helping CMS with payer utilization management and inserting itself between patients and their doctors. In fact, Section 1801 of the Medicare law explicitly bars CMS from supervising or controlling clinical care, yet that's how its Medicare CED coverage policy is being applied. This behavior undermines the FDA's authority as the nation's real biomedical agency, charged with ensuring the safety and efficacy of medical products. So I implore someone here today to join us in advocating for answers about Medicare access. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, our next uh, comment is from Dana. Dana, I apologize if I mispronounced your last name. And then our last comment will be from Terry Walter. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Dana Shulo, and I'm really thankful for the opportunity to speak to you all today. I'm coming to you with kind of a unique perspective. Uh, professionally, I am the health programs coordinator for the National Down Syndrome Society. Uh, this means I'm leading or assisting with all of the health and wellness related programming, resource creation, events, and advocacy work that we do. And many of these are related to Alzheimer's disease. Um, as many of you know, the overall lifetime risk of developing Alzheimer's disease is more than 90% for individuals with Down syndrome. This is the devastating reality for families across the country and the world. NDSS continually hears from desperate families and individuals looking for treatments and a cure for Alzheimer's disease. To help address this, we've produced a guidebook and hosted a webinar last month on Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, and both can be accessed through the NDSS website. But all of that is only part of the reason that I'm here today. 
Uh, the most important reason is Anthony. Anthony loves to bowl and go to restaurants and he hunts and fishes. He does arts and crafts. He has so many friends um, and he has a job that he loves where he assists with car oil changes. Um, in his spare time, he exchanges handwritten letters with elderly and ill members of our community, and they have all grown to absolutely love him. Uh, Anthony is not just one of the estimated 250,000 Americans with Down syndrome. He's my best friend, he is my only sibling, and he's my little brother. When Anthony was 23 years old, he began having seizures. As part of his medical care, he received scans of his brain. Uh, the doctor was grave when they told us that Anthony's brain was already showing physical signs of early Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there was visible, visible plaque deposits. My parents cried as they talked about it uh, later in hushed voices when they thought I couldn't hear. Now, Anthony is aware of his high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. He is watching our grandmother progress through each increasingly horrifying stage of the disease. Sometimes he asks me if that's what it will be like for him. Each time I rack my brain to find an answer that includes hope, the best I've come up with is to tell him that I am doing everything in my power to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, today, I'm asking you to do everything in your power to give Anthony and the thousands of other individuals who have Down syndrome hope for a future free from Alzheimer's disease. This can be done by increasing access to quality clinical care by, spe <clears throat> by specifically discussing Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease in medical school curriculums, increasing funding for Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease research, encouraging inclusion in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease interventions, granting access to Alzheimer's disease treatments, which are covered by insurance, and educating long-term care facilities about serving individuals with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. On behalf of Anthony, my family, and the many, many Americans who share our lived experience, Thank you for your time and all of the work that you do and all of the work that you will continue to do to fight this disease. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, our final comment is from Terry Wolf. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for letting me speak to you today. I am Terry Walter and I come to you from California and also I am a F. AFTD ambassador, but more importantly today, I'm coming to you as a family member of the Walter family. The Walter family has had six family members that I know of pass from FTD and ALS, beginning in uh, 1981 and ending in 2007 with the death of my husband. At one point in time, we had three brothers in the midst of the FTD ALS, one in the last, last stages, one in the middle stages, and my husband being the youngest in the beginning stages of FTD and ALS. The Walter family has since learned we are a genetic family. And because these three brothers were so dedicated to research, trying to find a cure, this was back in the early 2000s for FTD, so no one else would have to study, I mean, become symptomatic if you get FTD. We, the C9 ORF72 gene was discovered because of the participation that these three brothers did. Today, we have eight children and 15 grandchildren that are at risk for developing the FTD or ALS because of the C9. That's why we are, me and myself, are so passionately about bringing awareness to it. Today, even um, FTD is so misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed, and currently it can take three years or longer to get a diagnosis. But more importantly, in that time, before we know what is going on, families are put into turmoil, both emotionally and financially. And I know personally, uh, Stephen passed in 2007, 
And it's only been in the last couple of years that financially and even emotionally that I've really been able to put myself back together. That's why I'm so here today to bring the awareness and the importance of NAPA to continue the funding and support for FTD, ALS, and any other neurological dementias that are out there. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Terry. And then finally, we have one comment that I was asked to read, but it is six pages long. And unfortunately, I don't want to silence anyone, but I feel as though it would be inappropriate for me to cut it off or decide what parts to read. So I'm sending to everyone by email right now, and it will be part of the public record. So thank you to all of our public commenters. Yes, I agree, um, Helen. Thank you to all of our public commenters. Thank you to all of the um, federal participants. Thank you to all of our um, council members for attending today. It's been a remarkable day. We learned so much about the progress that's occurring within our federal updates. I kept hearing the word in col collaboration, collaboration and dissemination. And that was breath. It just opened up my eyes to how important that is that we can get all of this information out that's being done in everybody's program. I heard very clearly the importance of getting reauthorization of the NAPA Older Americans Act and others. That, that's very important to keep things going forward. As we got into the afternoon, we began to talk about the importance of all these new treatments that are available, but understanding with a keen eye that it's not the end, it's only the beginning. We do have a treatment available, but it's so much we don't know. And we need funding. We need research funding to be able to answer all those questions. We also learned a lot about the lack of knowledge of how prevalent things like Lewy body and frontal temporal dementia is because we don't have biomarkers. And without biomarkers, we're limited in not only estimating the true prevalence, but beginning to find um, conditions to, to treatments for those conditions. And then with our last set of uh, presenters, I heard the impact on families. And that's the bottom line. That's why we're here. It's impacting people and their families. And we need to make sure that we move forward within NAPA with the reauthorization because we need to be able to find out how to prevent, treat, and cure all forms of dementia. So thank you all for attending today. And I look forward to our next meeting in April. Thank you. Thank you. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.